begin with um, a bit in a bit uh, of some introductory notes, and then we'll just jump right into it. Um, so although we are gathering here from across the world, the Ryerson Department of Architectural Science is located in Toronto. So I will begin with a land acknowledgement. Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in a spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. As architects and designers who make their marks on the land with our physical structures, we not only have to be critical of our environmental impact on the earth due to climate change, but also our relationships with and impact on the first peoples of the land to which we are settlers too. So the symposium is an annual event hosted every year by the Ryerson University Master of Architecture class. The entire planning of the event, the selection of the topics and of the speakers are done solely and collectively by the class. The theme for this year's symposium is titled Urban Metamorphosis. Climate change is drastically changing the environments that we live in. Environmental disasters and unpredictable weather patterns are causing displacement and forced migration into cities. The global trend of rapid urbanization is requiring us to rethink how our cities are structured. Urban metamorphosis addresses a range of issues facing the architectural practice today. This virtual symposium will give speakers the opportunity to share their insights, perspectives, and ideas addressing how the urban landscape will respond to the complexities of changing environmental conditions. What constitutes a resilient city? What interventions can be implemented today to promote the future preparedness of cities? Will urban environments take on a new identity? These questions and more will be addressed in a series of discussions to come. Today's event will be broken down into two halves. For the first hour, we will have a succession of 15 minute talks by our three invited speakers. Then for the second hour, we'll begin a group panel discussion with the speakers and our moderator. And at the end of the panel, we invite the audience to ask any questions in the Q&A feature below. And that's all for me. Now my colleague Adam will introduce our guests today. Hello everyone. Uh, so today we have three speakers and our moderator. Uh, starting off with the speakers, our first speaker is Krista Palin. Uh, Krista is an associate director at Transolar New York. She brings passion for design at the intersection of architecture, engineering, computation, and ecology. Her expertise is in passive design, including daylight modeling, uh, thermal insulation, sorry, thermal simulation, and natural ventilation design. Krista's varied education in environmental engineering, architecture, and inter interdisciplinary design provides a unique skill set to manifest elegant, high comfort, low energy buildings. Our second speaker is Julia King. Julia King is a research fellow at LSE Cities and a coordinator for numerous research strands, including Streets for All, a research project commissioned by the Greater London Authority, and ongoing work on urban governance in India. Trained as an architect in her research, design practice and teaching focus on sanitation and housing in the context of rapid urban, sorry, rapid urbanization and inequitable infrastructure developments and urban microculture in the UK and India. She currently teaches at the city's master's program at LSE and runs a design studio at Central St. Martins. Our third speaker is Thaddeus Pulowski. Thaddeus Pulowski is an urban designer who seeks to integrate resilience and climate change adaptation into the long-term development patterns of cities through design of projects, policies, and programs. In a partnership with 100 Resilient Cities and the Rockefeller Foundation, he helped to establish a resilient accelerator, which brings together the local leaders and global experts to drive the implementation of resilient projects around the world. Thaddeus planned for disasters at New York City offices of emergency management, work to reduce the likelihood of impact for disaster for New York City planning, and help the city to recover from Hurricane Sandy at the New York City Mayor's office. 
He also has an extensive global experience working as a subject matter expert in cities facing the hazards of climate change. And he is a master's of architecture from University of Pennsylvania and was a 2015 Loeb fellow at Harvard University. And finally, our moderator is Alex Buzikovich from the Global Mail. He is the Global Mail's architecture critic and he attended the University of Toronto and the City University of New York. He's the co-author of Toronto Architecture, a City Guide with McClellan and Stewart in 2017. And he has won a national magazine award and has also written for design publications such as Azure, Blueprint, Dwell, Spacing, and Wallpaper. And now we will commence our presentations starting with Krista. Thanks so much for the introduction. Bear with me while I share my screen. Okay, uh, so thanks so much. Um, I'm so excited to be speaking with all of you today. Um, uh, about this topic. I think it's super interesting. And uh, I feel very lucky that you guys are all uh, choosing to spend your Saturday or portion of your Saturday with us. Um, I am uh, an associate director at Chancellor New York. And um, we are a climate engineering firm is what we call it. Uh, we focus on building high comfort, low impact buildings and environments. Um, as mentioned before, we work sort of at the intersection of uh, design and engineering, and we really work to foster innovation in, in the built environment. That's the main focus area of our work. And we have been extremely fortunate uh, over the span of our company's life to work with just amazingly talented, uh, incredible architects um, who uh, really produced uh, some fantastic work with us. And we were also very lucky to be able to get to work with them right from the beginning of their design process such that we were able to help them shape the architecture to be really high performance and, and do some sort of special and unexpected things um, with them. And I'm going to talk about a couple projects in my lecture uh, that maybe will illustrate what exactly that all means. Um, so on the topic of urban metamorphosis, what this, really means to me in my work is that um, we are starting to get just tons and tons of, of requests and there's a lot of ambition out there right now for things like net zero development, improved outdoor comfort and healthy buildings, super low, ultra low energy buildings. Um, and that's just fantastic. Um, but how do you do that? And I think there's a lot of confusion out there about how, how you actually get there and how we get there on projects is all I can tell you. Um, so the, the main things that we like to focus on are light, air, uh, comfort, and energy and GHG emissions. So I'm just gonna go through uh, a couple, couple of different projects and focus on these different topic areas just so that you can get a taste of, of what that really means. So starting off with light, and uh, when I mean light, I mean daylighting in buildings. And daylighting, of course, is fantastic for reducing your electrical energy consumption because uh, you don't need to turn on lights if you have enough daylight. But even more importantly for uh, wellness, it's really important for our circadian rhythm. And maybe even more importantly, uh, for getting this experience of delight in buildings and, and delight in architecture. And I think that daylight is really one of the main uh, things that got me into this practice is just ha having that spectacular experience of daylight in a space uh, got me in, into this career. And in, my company is uh, headed, head office in Germany, in Stuttgart. And in Germany, it's actually the law that all workstations have access to daylight in sufficient quantity that even on a cloudy day, you don't need to turn on lights overhead for people to work. And it's seen as a quality of life issue. So, um, you know, this is a real uh, driver for our practice to, to have daylight. Um, we try to avoid as much as possible internal spaces where people don't have access to the facade um, because it's seen, you know, in Germany as, as a bit inhumane. 
And uh, we have lots of fantastic projects that illustrate things like this, but one of my favorites is uh, this one, uh, Clemson's Lee Hall, which is an architecture school at the University of Clemson with, uh, done by Thomas Pfeiffer and Partners. Uh, and uh, Thomas Pfeiffer's projects are some of my absolute favorites. Um, when it comes to daylight design, they're barely, they have this beautiful diffuse light, really daylight throughout the whole whole project in ways that you really didn't think was even possible. And uh, I really love uh, working with them. So this project uh, achieves this through these um, Oculus style skylights, which are protected to the south to avoid the direct solar coming from that. And they're completely covering the entire roof, which is also a greener. And they create this beautiful, really airy feeling inside this double height space. And um, it's, they basically don't need any electric lighting on during the year at all. And uh, because the skylights are very protective of the uh, too much solar coming in, um, we're still able to do all of the cooling in this hot and humid South Carolina and climate with a radiant floor. This concrete floor is a radiant floor as well. Um, another version, which is like ultra simple, but the same principles apply is this project I worked on with Mass Design, which is the Rwandan Institute for Conservation Agriculture. Um, it's a school for students to come and learn about different farming practices in Rwanda. Um, and this is a vegetable and tree farm classroom, uh, which we wanted to make it fully daylit, especially because this whole campus is completely off the grid. It's all powered by solar panels. And uh, so, if there was any areas of uh, energy use in the buildings which were available to be zero, they had to be zero. Um, so uh, that was the, the goal for this project. Um, the, this is very much at the equator, but the sun does go slightly into the north and south facade, but it stays pretty much overhead completely. So uh, it was fairly simple to just have a little bit of a roof overhang with these uh, clear story skylights and we were able to completely illuminate the entire, the entire building such that we wouldn't need any electric lights on during the day. Um, this project was built last year and it's open right now. They're using it. You can see this is the, the space inside where students are, are working. It's working really well. Uh, next up, we're gonna talk about air. So when I talk about air, I'm really meaning natural ventilation and access to um, bringing air into your space from outside. And again, this is kind of seen for us as a, a quality of life issue, you know, these kind of sealed buildings with no, no ability to open your windows when it's nice outside seems like very strange to us and kind of uh, cruel. <laughs> so uh, it's really important to, to be able to have an operable facade um, that allows you to let air in as long as, you know, the outside is, is comfortable. Um, and it's also an energy issue because if you can do natural ventilation, you can save all the fan energy that you would be using to circulate all the uh, air for ventilation. And you can also a lot of times bring in a lot more air than you would be able to with your mechanical system. So you can do more cooling than you would have been able to with that air and you can basically eliminate uh, a large part of your, your mechanical cooling. Um, the project that I'm gonna use to talk about this is George Brown College's Arbor. Um, some of you may be familiar with it. Um, I know Carol teaches at Ryerson. Uh, this is by Moria Manteshima Architects and uh, it's right down by the water in Toronto. I mean, it will be once it's constructed. Uh, oh, and uh, Axon Austria Architects as well. Um, and it's mass timber construction, um, really beautiful building. Um, there are classrooms on the north and south side here. And then there are these meeting room, meeting spaces on the uh, east and west sides where you see this tall, tall section and uh, also some solar chimneys on either side. So um, yes, there are uh, dampers in the, um, in the chimneys and they will open up when it's comfortable outside and there'll be an indicator light in the classrooms. Students can open up their windows and move through the classroom through these acoustically projected transfer vents uh, into the corridor down through the corridor here and um, up and out through the chimneys. Um, the available stack effect is different on every floor. So that has been uh, carefully balanced and engineered and the pressure points along the way are also carefully balanced. So that such that all of the floors get enough ventilation uh, through the system that we can guarantee that they're not getting overventilated and they're not getting underventilated. 
Um, and they're also providing the cooling during the natural ventilation season. Just briefly how the chimney works in natural ventilation mode, the, um, the air moves into the chimney um, and up and out through the top through natural stack effect. The solar also on the facade it helps increase the heat, which will increase the stack effect. Um, the, in heating mode, the chimney closes at the top and bottom and really works as a, um, as a double facade. So it's like a warm buffer between the chimney and, uh, and the outside. And in cooling mode, what you don't want is for that chimney to build up heat and then that heat to leach into the building. So it opens up at the top and bottom and it just cycles through and doesn't heat up the rest of the building. And this is a rendering of what it looks like inside of that breathing room. Okay, um, so now uh, just briefly touching on comfort and we're talking about human comfort, but specifically um, for this case, outdoor comfort. And when we get requests for you know these developments with improved outdoor comfort, what people are generally asking for is reduced extreme heat days, uh, or you know how do you how how can we do effective shading so that we reduce overheating when people are in, in this plaza, or how can we do wind protection so that people are not uh, so cold and they want to spend some more time outside. Um, but what this project I'm going to talk about is kind of taking the same principles that we use when we do that kind of um, designing, but to create a really special space. Um, so this is um, Zariadia Park, which is in Moscow outside of the Kremlin. Um, it's by Diller's Video and Renfro out of New York City. And um, I worked on this project a few years ago. The idea behind the park was to create uh, all the different uh, ecological zones of Russia within one park. And so everything from this, which is supposed to represent the most tropical zone of Russia, to uh, an ice cave, uh, which is supposed to represent the the um, the most Arctic zone of Russia. Um, and this part was one of my uh, main focuses. And it's basically a glass dome, which covers a grass covered Philharmonic theater. And um, the idea is that it will stay warm, warmer, as warm as we can do it without, you know, putting uh, energy into it and wasting energy uh, all year round so that people can enjoy it. and. Uh, because they're colder so they can enjoy it in the winter as well. So there is a glass dome, like I said, on top of this uh, film harmonic theater. And the idea is that the glass dome will naturally catch uh, hot air as it rises up and not allow it to escape. And uh, a lot of work was done to kind of look at the shape of the dome to make sure that wind wasn't gonna come up uh, underneath it and blow out all of our captured heat. Um, however, uh, so it's enclosed only on one side, but it was really important that it still be completely barrier free. Um, so that you're just kind of walking up into this warm environment. Uh, we also are using some waste heat from other parts of the park, as well as exhaust air from the Philharmonic and jumping into the space to kind of boost up the heat. Um, so we did some modeling to predict what the climate would be underneath the dome. Uh, the blue shape at the bottom represents the ambient temperature there. So the uh, minimum and maximum temperatures that we'd expect. And the gray shape at the top represents uh, what we predict it would feel like under the dome. So you can see we have about a 20 degrees Celsius increase over the outdoor temperature in the winter. And of course, we also want to avoid that 20 degree increase in the summer because that would just be really uncomfortable and potentially dangerous. So we had to have lots of operability in the dome so that it would flush itself out as much as possible. So we only have a five degree increase in the summer here, which is what we were looking for. So another picture of the dome. I think this was an opening day, so it was pretty busy. You can see some of the actuators there um, on some of the, the triangle pieces for the operable parts of the dome. And I've unfortunately never gotten to visit this project, but I wanted to see if it was working. So I was poking around on Instagram back in 2018, and I found this posted from January 29th in the winter in 2018, and the grass was still green, and it was snowing outside. So. Uh, it was obviously working to some degree. Um, uh, next topic up uh, is energy and GHG emissions. And um, this is obviously super important and it's very important to consider both supply and, uh, and demand. So when thinking about energy, what we think about is what uses dominate the energy consumption. Is it space heating or cooling? Meaning is it a lot of solar driven? 
or extremely cold temperatures. There's a ventilation heating or cooling that happens when you have a lot of occupancy. Um, lighting, the fans, the plug bulbs. Um, you know, it's basically is it just user behavior and what is it? And then you kind of pick at each compartment individually, and that's the only way you can get down to a low energy building. You have to attack all of these together. Um, the project that I'm going to talk about with this is uh, the TRCA, Toronto Region and Conservation Authority, uh, new headquarters, which is a broken ground now, which we worked on with Buchholz McAvoy Architects out of Ireland and ZAS Architects out of Toronto. Um, it's located near York University on a ravine. Uh, this is a photograph I took of the architects exploring the site on the first day, the same site as their old headquarters, um, which is just being replaced. Um, and the both the location and the you know the kind of purpose of the TRCA really made us want to make an extremely low energy building. This is another mass timber building, um, and you can see that we have these two central atriums here. It's completely daylit as well, the whole floor plate. Um, and then we also uh, decided to to do something a little in interesting and integrate these uh, waterfalls inside the atrium to make them part of the mechanical system. Um, so the waterfalls are connected directly to a geothermal system by a, um, a, a direct connection without going through a heat pump. So it's just circulation water. It's basically the ground temperature all year round. The, the air coming into the building uh, passes by this uh, waterfall and starts warming up or cooling down depending on the season before going into these different uh, small decentralized ventilation units, which have energy recovery. Uh, air goes into the ground, into the floor plate, and then uh, through these, out through VAV diffusers, uh, back to the, back to these uh, ventilation units, and then up and out through the same, uh, the same location, but a different pathway. And of course, all of the heating and cooling is also being done uh, with geothermal and heat pump. So, that's basically how the heating and cooling work in this building, uh, which is extremely low energy. We also have a natural ventilation mode where um, the air just moves through these different office spaces and uh, up and out through the uh, atrium at the center. And the, the, we also have this other special mode here, which we call extended natural ventilation. We did a lot of modeling to see that the, um, the south facade of this building has a ton of solar. So we decided to make this sort of double facade over the windows of the south facing uh, facade here, which allow us to do this natural ventilation preheat mode. So um, one of the times, one of the reasons sometimes you can't do natural ventilation is just the temperature of the air is too cold. Like you still need cooling in the building, but people near the window would be too cold if you opened it. So this kind of solves that problem. It does preheating of the natural ventilation air. And uh, in that time when it's like 10 degrees outside, when it's just be too cold, and we're really able to extend the natural ventilation season using that on this part of the building. So on the top here, this is these, these are um, uh, this kind of chart. Basically, every dot represents um, an hour of the building in terms of uh, the operation time. And so these dots here represent the time when it's in mechanical heating. The yellow represents the time when it's in this natural ventilation preheat mode. Uh, green represents the time when we're in natural ventilation. So you can see we're in natural ventilation almost the entire summer. Very little time is actually going to be necessary in cooling. And um, and I think it's only for over this um, very yeah very very low portion of the time. And on the bottom you can see the corresponding operative temperatures that are people are experiencing in the building. So um, it is very comfortable. These yellow dots represent 26 to 28, which is happening in this natural ventilation. Uh, time, but that is still able to be completely comfortable with the use of ceiling fans. Uh, another rendering of the building, this is that south-facing facade that I was talking about that is facing the ravine. And you can see we have PV uh, to offset our THG emissions from the grid component of the energy use. And this is rendering of that uh, waterfall inside the center of the building, which is encased in the shaft because the, the shaft is, is containing the air that's going to be passing over this, uh, this waterfall. Um, and uh, don't worry too much about this, but just it is a super low energy building. This is our Toronto Green Standard performance. Uh, we have 53 kilowatt hours per meter squared. 
um, and really low uh, GHG emissions, well into tier four on both of those uh, categories. Um, so just to, to wrap up, I wanted to briefly touch on energy performance standards. Um, uh, if people are familiar with what's going on with energy performance standards, there's just tons of stuff popping up. It's kind of like Wild West out there. And it's kind of frustrating, like, why are there so many ways to describe the same thing? But actually, it, things are getting better. I think, um, you know, that just to briefly cover what there's, there's some standards that, uh, that there's some standards that reference uh, that have make you build a reference case, and then you compare your percent improvement to that reference case. Some standards like the Toronto Green Standard and Passive House have a line in the sand, absolutely, you must not have more than X kilowatt hours per meter squared. Also, some that have um, a thermal performance standards as well that really focus on what is your building doing, not you know things like plug loads or or, or things you can't control as well with the architecture. Um, and then there's things like local ninety seven, local law ninety seven in New York, which is really capping all the CO two emissions for even existing buildings. And a lot of these different systems are doing this tiered approach where the entry point is not so bad in the next couple of years, it's going to be okay, but then it's ramping up really quickly down to super low energy buildings. And honestly, it's it's really exciting. I think the Toronto Green Standard is is really well thought out and, and uh, I think it's going to be have a fantastic influence on everything that's coming up. And, um, and I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's really exciting and I, I hope that it helps that there starts to be more and more clarity and understanding in the community about what these different standards actually actually mean um, in the next few years. Um, and then finally, uh, last thing is just briefly touching on this concept of net zero energy versus net zero emissions. What is net zero energy? Net zero energy is like a budget. So we make a budget for your building based on the amount of PV you're allowed to have, you able to have on your rooftop. For example, or you, if you don't have PV, you have a windmill or wind tower, then that's different, but it's pretty rare. Um, that typically it's PV, and then all of your energy use has to fit within that budget on an annual basis. Um, and that's your emissions is really offsetting your portion of your grid electricity that comes from fossil fuel components. So for us in Toronto, that just means the gas power plants, everything else is basically renewable. Um, however, you know, the grid is changing. So that's a moving target. And in the next few years, they're going to take down some of the nuclear power plants and they're going to add a lot of gas. So we're going from about 6% to about 22% um, in the next, uh, in the next 10, 15 years. So, you know, if you're planning to do a net zero GHG emissions, you got to be thinking about adding some buffers so that um, your GHG emissions truly are zero uh, in the future. Um, and finally, I guess I just wanted to say that from my perspective in my work, uh, architects are really the protagonists of this like story of urban metamorphosis. You know, you, we are here to help uh, architects, but we really need architects to fight through the process, uh, to take the time to educate their clients through case studies, to take the time to collectively agree with their design team and their clients to the project's priorities early, um, to do evaluation of integrated design, options, not just, you know, shading or not shading individually, um, make decisions on more than just energy and payback, you know, also quality of life is super important, and to integrate architecture and performance. And uh, finally, just be ambitious, you know, it's okay if you don't hit your target, as long as your target is high, you're still going to do well, but uh, also to try to understand, know what you're aiming for. And that's it. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Krista. Up next is Julia King with her presentation. Thanks so much, Krista. That was fascinating. Um, we are now going to jump ship slightly. Um, so uh, it's always a bit weird speaking into, into the void of Zoom. Um, right. Uh, th that, and thanks, Adam, for that introduction. Um, just to add to that a little bit, yeah, I sort of, I did train in architecture and I like to think that I operate within the field of architecture, but I think um, there, there are many like me who are actually sort of peripheral to mainstream practice. Um, and, and you'll see, see why in my talk maybe. Um, so thank you for inviting me because I always feel really honored um, as a sort of architect, non-architect <laughs> in the group. Um, just to sort of right now, the kinds of things that I'm working on, because I'm obviously not going to India. I've been locked at my, in my home pretty much since November. 
Um, I've been trying to think of new ways to teach and new ways to engage with audiences. And I've set up this apprenticeship scheme at the LSE where we're getting young kids to learn and work at the LSE on, on urban issues and, and pay them. And um, I'm, I'm also doing a project on waste, picker, waste pickers, sort of seeing how I can work with people in Ethiopia and Pakistan remotely. So um, I don't know if we're gonna go there in the conversation, but um, my work is really varied. Um, but my main body of work and my main interest um, is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, sorry. Uh, and that is, 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 is India and its sanitation. Um, so when, when we were asked to, to think, uh, to, you know, how the urban landscape will respond to the complexities of changing environmental conditions through the lens of our work and practice, um, I, I, you know, I, I had to, to, to go to, to India, which is just for those who are wondering my connection to India. I am Venezuelan and English, but I grew up there. So um, it's, a, it's a place where I feel very, very comfortable. Um, um, and, and what I want to sort of start with is that if our, our global urban landscape, for me, is, is defined by inequality, that is the rubric under which everything else sits. Cities today are the most unequal places in the world. So urban inequality is higher today than it than it was in, you know, in the 1920s. Um, and broadly, yes, the global poor are less poor, but we have become more unequal by income and more unequal by race in the last 20 years. So a sort of fundamental question I think we should be asking ourselves as designers is, does design have a role to play in addressing questions of urban inequality? And I extend that to issues of social and environmental justice. And reframing that around the theme of today is thinking about how we as designers can tackle the complexities of our urban conditions, leading to that ultimate goal of contributing to how citizens can make urban space. So in other words, how we can actualize change on the ground fully recognizing that these complexities are political, social, economic, environmental, and it's really hard to hold all these things. And so in order to do that, um, you know, I found that actually some of the most valuable lessons I've had in my work uh, are not drawn through success stories, but for those projects that, that didn't materialize as one might have hoped. And so for this presentation, where I only have 15 minutes, I'm, I'm going to sort of pack it in and dip, dip into two projects in Delhi in two different sites and talk about a project in Savda Gevra that was, um, you know, arguably a success. Um, I won some awards for it. So maybe if that's a metric um, and, and one in T-Camp that was arguably a failure. Uh, so we're going to start off and go to Savda Gevra. Savda is a peripheral site. And it was established by the state to relocate slum dwellers from the inner city of Delhi to the outskirts. And each household received a plot, which they then developed reflecting their sort of individual capacity and the kind of money that they had and developed them, you know, sort of each household by themselves. And the result was what I referred to as, I like to refer to as a, as a spectrum of housing types starting from a shack on one end, you know, made of tarpaulin, all the way through to a multi-story dwelling. Um, but most of the housing in Safda, when I first started going there in 2008 to 2010, was, was single story, three by four meters, you know, with an average of six people living in them, which is, is pretty shocking. And, um, and the planning of Safda Gevra, when, where, as I said, when I first started going there, uh, just included nine community toilet complexes. And if you assumed all of those latrines were working, which they weren't, you know, here's an image of, of the complex, um, that would be one latrine for every 250 women. And the end result of this kind of inadequacy is that most people would defecate in the open. And in order to redress this, individuals with the means and the financial resources would invest in a toilet. And the common practice uh, was and is still today to build a tank or a pit underneath your home which would hold the shit and um and, and the result was that often these would leak into the ground you know percolating into and, and polluting valuable groundwater supplies but also damp 
um, go up into the house and was often a cause of structural failure. So my, my, uh, I, I was always, I was sort of really interested in understanding this kind of transformation and, and what this looked like and, and in spending lots of time in Sabda Gevra, you know, I, 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 can, I can share that with you. So um, here is a, a one, a sing, the same house shown many years apart. In 2010, the family would defecate in, in a field and they would wash in this sort of little shack um, outside their home. And the following year, all those activities have moved into the house because they've invested in a toilet, which you can see here. And here it is a couple of years later when actually they've added another toilet uh, up here and they've tiled their house. Um, and really, uh, so, so all of this development is around the, the inclusion of a toilet. And in this case, it was triggered because of a bride entering into the family home, but it's often also triggered a young girl coming of age. And, um, but this practice of building individual household tanks often would actually result in sort of pretty bad, a pretty bad built environment for, for, for most people. Because a lot of these pits would just overflow into open drains. So really high pathogen content flowing into what is meant to move rainwater. And so it's in this context that I started working with a local NGO. And I'm not gonna go into the community consultation process, but we, we ended up, out of looking at the, you know, observing this, this, this situation, delivering an affordable sanitation system to this community. And um, the, the sort of components of the project, um, you know, which I designed were, were really simple, really, really simple. Um, you had in-house toilets, um, you, you know, which would be the responsibility of the, own home, uh, the, of the homeowner, a series of communal drains that would run through the neighborhood, taking the effluent to a shared, primary treatment of a septic tank, which would then overflow into a secondary treatment and upflow filter, which would then discharge for reuse and for agricultural construction purposes. Um, and this is, um, you know, so for $50,000, we could service an entire community of around 2000 people, which is about $25 per head of investment. And here you can see the, the site of this under construction and a more recent shot taken in 2019, which was the last time I got on a flight and did international travel. Um, so um, since completing the project, you know, which, which was completed in 2014, I've, I've, I've had the privilege of being able to return to Savda almost yearly on a yearly basis and to see if my thesis was right. You know, that my idea was that basic technology would allow for residents to tap into the system over time and gradually improve their homes. You know, I felt they can't do the infrastructure, so I'll do that, and, but they can do the housing. So let's see, it, see if we can accelerate the, you know, their own self-built homes. What ended up happening was that many of the shacks actually made an investment and you can see the toilet being made here, but they, didn't, they couldn't financially upgrade their homes. And then on the flip side, what happened, um, which you can see the image on the right, is that because of the arrival of sewage, small scale developers, bottom of the pyramid developers stepped in and started buying up multiple plots and building these kind of mega houses and selling them on to external buyers. So um, my kind of, uh, you know, incremental modes of city making, such as adaptation, consolidation and retrofitting can transform lives. You know, particularly in contexts with limited resources and outside the gaze of urban renewal programs. So incrementalism enables this kind of a social and spatial experimentation to emerge that allow for the gradual consolidation of resources over time. But do communities have the institutional capacity to sustain these urban transformations and the maintenance process? You know, without attending to other structural problems, and, and, and like access to finance, um, you know, these improvements will be limited. And so, you know, a question that I, I'm left with is, do these infrastructure and the sort of de facto formalization of property actually benefit the most vulnerable? Or does it potentially kickstart a gentrification process, which actually further mar marginalizes those original beneficiaries? So I'm now going to jump to T-Camp. And um, so I, my entry into T Camp was we just finished Savda, and I was asked to consult on this project, um, with you know by the same NGO, and it, uh, they wanted to put a sewer line through through the slum, and um, and so we we designed you know using very similar technology, sort of small shallow drains, 
Um, but in this case, the sewer ran into the city mains. Um, and the community were, were actually responsible for, for driving the whole project, the uh, setting it up, you know, the, I mean, really, it was very hands off, particularly from, from my side. And um, again, I sort of had the privilege to return. So this was, uh, I came back in 2016, which was, you know, almost, almost two years after um, having consulted on the design. And I was really interested to see what was the uptake of toilets. And I found that many people, um, you know, had made the investment of a connection, but were still to actually make the toilet. So here is a sort of a classic example. You can see the connection, you know, that's the inlet into the drain, but there is no toilet there yet. And it was just stuffed with the rag. And, but then I came back a year later and here, you know, this is, I think a classic image of architecture without architects, this incredibly compact toilet come staircase has been built and she's actually, you know, connected into the infrastructure. Um, so a lot of my work involves a lot of surveying. And so I went throughout tea camp surveying each house and I was, uh, wanted to understand the, up, you know, the uptake around toilets. So asking who had a toilet, who built it, was there evidence of any kind of design thinking, how much people had spent. And then for those people who didn't have toilets, you know, why didn't you? And, and I went house to house and I, and I actually at the end concluded much to my surprise that it wasn't actually mostly a lack of money, the reason why people didn't have toilets, it was actually a lack of space. Um, and, and, and I decided to just zone, zone in on this courtyard, which you can see the image here, to actually further kind of scrutinize that kind of question of going, you know, what's going on here. And um, again, to cut a really long, this was a year and a half long journey that I was on um, and I'm compressing it into two slides. Um, but we, the end of a kind of process of talking to people was to design, uh, you can see a sort of basic diagram here. We, we came up with this idea of a shared toilet to complement the public provision um, for the residents of just that courtyard. And, um, and here's an image you can see most of the consultation was actually had to happen at night um, because that was the only time that we could actually get all the residents together. And um, unfortunately, this this project didn't didn't materialize. And I think, it, you know, it, it, the reason was sort of three things. Um, and, and in order, uh, the site's really dense, really, really incredibly dense. So um, a phenomenal amount of people lived around that courtyard. And um, the uh, and they, they all have varying needs and wants. Um, there's also a gender imbalance. So there were four men to every woman, and we all know that uh, the relationship between sanitation between men and women is very different. But perhaps the most important thing was the arrival of the threat of regeneration, and that threat came fast and came quickly and out of nowhere, and it rendered that kind of investment, it rendered it redundant. So, you know, co-production relies, you know, that's what we were trying to do was sort of co-produce a sort of complementary provision of sanitation relies on these sort of regular long-term relationships between a kind of intervention agency and organized groups of citizens. But this actually requires the state and the private sector to recognize and value community-driven approaches and local entrepreneurialism. And actually this can often come into conflict. So dy dynamic urban settings can create new temporalities, which are in conflict with that kind of politics of patience. You know, my, my project working for a year and a half, that's a politics of patience. The slow and high social investment required by community led planning and maintenance projects. So to, to sort of wrap up, you know, what is the role of the designer? You know, uh, thinking in, you know, in Indian and Southern cities and, and what conclusions can be drawn from there elsewhere? You know, because it's not just a prom the, the practice, this kind of practice of architecture isn't promising because it delivers better infrastructural provision. It's promising, promising because it gets entangled with the kind of politics of the life that, of the people who which we are talking to and from. And, and I do want to sort of say that those who have done the most are actually the people who live in these communities themselves. They are the only ones who've built housing at any kind of scale for what's required. They're the ones who've tapped into the mains when the state has failed to do so. They're the ones that actually often pay the most for electricity. So if we're concerned with how most people live in this world, 
interventions must be framed as an exercise about what we can learn from those very people who've done the most. So I think I've, I've actually run out of time. So um, I'm gonna stop there and uh, look forward to chatting with you all afterwards. Thank you very much, um, Julia. Next is Thaddeus's presentation. Hi, this is that was <clears throat> so great to see those last two presentations. Um, really inspiring work. I guess um, uh, I'm sort of more like Julia um, in that I was trained as an architect and became something else, something more peripheral. Um, but somewhat, I'm so amazed by this very on the ground approach of Julia's and I'd love to hear more about how that's evolved in the in this space of um, you know everything being virtual now um, because we've been challenged with that too so I'm yeah like trained as an architect but then I worked in government for about 15 years and for the last four years or so I've been running this research center at Columbia University the Center for Resilient Cities and Landscapes where we try to use our tools of design to help places around the world adapt to climate change. And I'll just start with a quick story that happened to me recently, which was that I would, I'm at Columbia University, so I get to talk to people in different fields a lot, which is probably the best part of working at a university. And so I, I was speaking to a mathematician uh, recently who showed me a computer model on his computer of the way that coronavirus spread around the world. And he said, this should look very familiar to you. I said, why? And he said, because this is, the mathematical increments here are the same pattern of urbanization, that you have one large city in a territory, and then the second city is like half the size of that territory. And then it sort of spreads out by these mathematical rules. And I was like, no, no, like I'm an, I'm a city planner, urban designer, like we decide where the cities go and that, you know, <laughs> and it felt like sort of disempowering for this mathematician to be like, no, this is all preordained by the laws of physics and that cities will just grow across the planet. And then I started to think like, well, like our cities, like, like this virus, you know, is this the same thing? Like, what is it that urban designers and architects and people who think about cities, civil engineers and others actually do here if, if, if these things are all sort of this entropic machine uh, that's just spreading petrochemical urbanization is this entropic machine that's finding its way into all these places on earth. Um, and so I think this year has been like the last year has really been about for many of us about like rethinking like fundamentally what are we doing here? And so we have this thing called the Center for Resilient Cities and Landscapes. And we've been thinking a lot about how communities and places are resilient. And so often that means trying to stand up against that entropic machine, trying to create a space for some sort of resistance, um, for some sort of place where people can attain a sense of belonging and uh, and to, to fight against the um, sort of the onslaught of the multiple threats of climate change, rapid urbanization and exploding inequality. Um, so I'll just share a little bit about our work now with that brief introduction. Let me see if I can do the screen share. Uh, right, okay. Um, and full screen, okay, there's me. Um, so I usually start by just talking about what you all know, I think, which is that uh, if we are to achieve this uh, redirection of that machine of urbanization to really change all of our systems in a way that preserves the habitability of our planet, we have to change everything, right? Like we have to change everything. And it's never really been contemplated at this scale. But we know as designers that things really do change, they can change, uh, and we can direct them to change, uh, but it's never, and, and it can happen quickly too. You can see how Toronto has changed so much in 20 years, or New York City or Delhi, they've all changed a lot. Um, but the scale of the transition away from a fossil fuel driven model of urbanization is going to require uh, a deep, um, restructuring and 
you know, of course, if we don't do it, if we don't do it, we know it's going to happen. We'll probably all be fine, frankly. Uh, rich people, uh, people in the, you know, global north will find ways to adapt and so forth. But the vast majority of humanity is already exposed to the consequences of a warming planet, of flooding, of wildfires, of extreme heat, of um, climate induced migration. So again, what we try to do is mobilize our resources at Columbia in small ways to help uh, support community leaders as they develop their adaptation plans. And we use this word resilience, which is sort of problematic, but has been sort of a catch-all phrase for how we empower ecosystems and communities to survive in the world crisis. So here's our website if you want to look at some of our work. I'll just use two quick examples today. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this three-year engagement with um, communities in coastal Mozambique. Coastal Mozambique is a fascinating um, place for both incredible ecological diversity, but an incredible history to crossroads of culture. Um, and uh, it's Mozambique's one, one of the poorest countries in the world. The Portuguese were brutal colonialists, the slave trade, and they had this terrible civil war. And now, um, and, and that really, they never were able to develop a lot, a lot of infrastructure, but you know, they have incredible uh, natural capital um, and also livelihoods that depend on that natural capital, um, fishing and um, subsistence farming. Uh, but recently there has been natural gas discovered offshore. So the World Wildlife Fund um, invited us to come and talk with people in Mozambique about how they could start to plan their future with gas extraction in a way that wouldn't repeat what has happened in so many extraction sites around the world, which is often called the resource curse. Basically, big multinational companies come take the gas, ruin the landscape, very little of that wealth feeds back into the local population. So here's the beach and uh, Palma today, which is this town in northern Mozambique, and here's here's what's under construction now. Um, it's a whole network of natural. This is like the world's fourth largest offshore deposit of of, of natural gas, and uh, these are the people that live there today. Really tragically, since the gas has been discovered, there has been an uprising of um, sectarian violence. Um, there have been um, a lot of what people are calling terrorist attacks. Um, it's not totally clear what the situation is, but it, in some ways it, it follows a pattern, a tragic pattern of um, the, uh, the civil strife that often follows these extraction landscapes. So we, we went there with our students and teamed up with Mozambican students and to have a series of conversations with the civic activists there, uh, World Wildlife Fund, but other local NGOs and the local government administration and the folks from Exxon and Anadarko, the oil companies that are coming to take the gas. Um, there's two Exxon people in this photo here. And we talked about like, what would this actually look like on the ground? They have an environmental impact statement, which is like a very boilerplate document that says, okay, we're gonna take so much gas and we have to blow a hole in the reef over here and we have to do these things, but it's like not, uh, visualized in a way that people can really understand what the consequence of gas exploration is. Um, so we went through and developed like um, an index of their natural capital, first of all, and the livelihoods that exist there today. And then we used case studies from around the world of different extraction sites to talk about what actually happens when the gas is extracted. Like what does it mean to harden the coastline and remove the coral reefs and the seagrass beds? How does that affect the local livelihoods and nutrition. Um, what does it mean to uh, build this gas plant and then see subsequent development, oftentimes like um, substandard housing in the lowland areas, in the cheap land? What does it mean to follow this pattern of economic development that preferences one singular source of, um, of revenue, which is the gas, and not diversify the economy? 
Um, so we use examples from different places in Africa, but even some of our own local U United States examples from uh, the Cancer Alley in Southern Louisiana, or I'm from Western Pennsylvania, which was like the original extraction landscape in North America, oil and coal. And we use these case studies and our understanding of how places transform with extraction to, to bring light to um, how things are likely to unfold in this place in the next 20 years um, and visualized it. And then we worked, you know, through conversations with the people there, what are some of the things that rise to the top in terms of what else could be done? Um, maybe some amount of natural gas could be explored um, to feed back into the local economy, but it, maybe it doesn't have to, uh, there are new technologies to extract it offshore and keep it offshore and not have to blow the coral reefs apart and dredge the seagrass beds and harden the coastlines. Maybe there's a way to retain the local livelihoods and the natural capital, even use the revenue from gas as the seed to start to preserve them and expand um, social infrastructure. Um, so this is basically, we made this propaganda so that the people in Mozambique can show ExxonMobil what they want, uh, what they expect from uh, the investment. So um, this is, uh, and then we brought our, it's hard to imagine, it seems like um, so long ago, but uh, two years ago, there was a, a series of two cyclones that hit coastal Mozambique in rapid succession um, in 2019. And they, um, they, they caused a lot of distraction and a lot of displacement. And so the city of Beira, which is a little bit south of where a lot of the gas is being extracted, uh, which is a city of about 500,000 people. It's almost hard to know how many people actually live there. It's a place that really urbanized rapidly during the Civil War uh, that followed Portuguese um, colonialism. And uh, it's self-built housing, you know, 90% self-built housing, except for a little strip along the waterfront that the Portuguese have built, um, which is sort of a shell of its colonial past. And so this, this city of Beira was, was uh, like completely destroyed by these cyclones. Um, and so the mayor of Beira and some local universities invited us to come study with them, how, how they were planning to rebuild this place and um, how uh, they can follow a different pattern for the long-term future of this place. So it's like a beach city. Um, and here's the cyclone, which actually this cyclone in March of I guess it was about two years ago now, really turned the in, interior of this region of Mozambique into an inland sea um, for, uh, uh, I think about two weeks standing water. Because Mozambique is in many ways like the lowlands of Eastern Africa, like a lot of the major rivers that drain Central Africa flow out into Mozambique. Um, the Ravuma, the Zambezi, this area is in the Zambezi River Delta. And so you can see that basically all the roofs were torn off by the cyclone. And this is, it's going to um, be approach a billion dollars of reconstruction needs. Um, and this is a Dutch, a Dutch engineer's plan for rebuilding the city very neatly is in this concentric grids. Um, but that's not really following the reality of the growth patterns of this place at all. Um, so we looked at the historical growth patterns and we talked with um, you know, the experts, the people, the leaders on the ground there from the different ministries and from um, the different activist groups there. Um, you know, when the place gets destroyed, there's this flood of international NGOs that come to a place at least for the first amount of time and try to do the thing that they've always done in this place. And so we went to listen to what they were doing, but also what the mayor and others thought they should be doing. And really this, you know, teaching um, in this context, we brought all of our urban design students, but the greatest part of it was building these partnerships between our students and the uh, Mozambican students. This is University of Zambezi. They just they just started an architecture program 
Um, and so we had to be there like really at the beginning and meet some of their first graduates and, and work together on these rebuilding plans and create this um, collaborative re um, rebuilding uh, uh, principles, first of all, but then also um, some physical ideas, just a few images of this place. Um, and so, yeah, usually when we come to these like questions about urban design, we always start with some broad principles, um, like what's there, you know, I think Julia just said so beautifully that, you know, we are not the experts here in so many cases. Our function as urban designers is often to show up and listen to people and really elevate uh, where we can through through collaborative and co-creative conversation. We, 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 we elaborate together on, on underlying values and principles. So, um, and then that helps us uh, generate ideas um, and practices that really build from what's already happening there, but try to use those international resources in this case to, to better um, uphold the values of the, of the people on the ground. So that's a quick, quick overview of our work that we've done in Mozambique, which seems so distant um, at this point, because in the last year, I'm gonna skip ahead and talk about, we also did some work in Tel Aviv, two years ago, mapping the urban heat island effect, trying to understand how this very hot Mediterranean climate was going to be much hotter in the future, according to climate scientists' projections. And therefore, uh, the city of Tel Aviv really wanted to know, like, how do we remake our public realm so that not everybody's just spending all their time in cars and apartments? And because really, this city has a lot more healing to do in order to become a really multicultural place that uh, it once promised to be. Um, and, you know, Tel Aviv is a place obviously that was uh, for thousands of years, um, Palestinian or, you know, a crossroads of culture as well. And then Jewish diaspora came, built beautiful city there, the Bauhaus architecture, and then uh, today, they're accepting more and more migrants from North Africa. So it really could be a multicultural city. But if everyone's in their cars and apartments all the time, and a lot of the people on the margins economically are forced into very inhospitable housing and uh, inhospitable neighborhoods that are going to get hotter and hotter, um, that could really exacerbate both the ecological future of this place, but also the social future. So. City of Tel Aviv asked us to come have a design trip to talk about how we cool down the public realm, introduce more and more planting in other ways, tactical ways to, to make the city um, cooler and more welcoming and more just and more multicultural. Uh, so we have these community workshops with them. But we follow, we, we, in all of our work, we've seen that extreme heat really tracks inequality and especially um, in American cities. You can, here's a redlining map. In the US, these maps were made, these redlining maps were made in the 1940s and they basically told banks that, you know, you couldn't lend to people in these areas to buy homes because they're like predominantly African-American or predominantly immigrant. But oftentimes this was a very, very real way to enforce, you know, centuries of um, racial oppression and racial segregation. Um, in, in the United States. And you can see that these redlining maps often mirror the built fabric of our cities today. And then this has been expressed in, in heat, but in health outcomes as well. There's Houston, there's Johannesburg. And then coming back to New York City, we saw that extreme heat really correlated with, in many cases, with the instances of um, coronavirus deaths. So we've been working in New York City I think a lot of us like who've been doing this international work shifted very rapidly this year to like work much more in our home context. So I've been working with high school students uh, who have an idea of turning the street in front of their school into a park. They've noticed these same patterns of environmental injustice, environmental racism, that uh, you know their neighborhood is disproportionately hotter in the summer than the cooler neighborhood up the hill which is wider and richer. And so they wanna turn the street into a park. 
So we went out with scientists and showed them how to use thermal cameras and map the urban heat island effect. And then we did some diagrams with them about how they could remake their, their place. So I think, is that my time? I'm gonna just wrap it up so we can have a conversation and just leave you with you if you wanna check out more of our work. Here's our website. Thanks. Oh, that was the uh, three minute warning, but I, I feel like we could we could go into conversation now if that suits you. For sure, for sure. thank you very much, Thaddeus. Um, now we're going to move into a uh, form of panel discussion in which our moderator, Alex, will moderate the discussion. Uh, feel free for the presenters to ask each other questions as well during this time period. Um, and I'll leave it to Alex now. Thanks, Adam. And uh, thank you to all the panelists. Uh, that was, uh, for me, a fantastically interesting set of talks. Um, you've touched on a number of issues that um, have been have interested me over the last few years as a writer, and a number of things that I think are directly relevant, actually, to the Toronto context, as well as to broader questions about practice that um, all you young architects will soon be tackling. Um, so we have a good long time to chat here, about half an hour. Um, so just to start with, um, I'll just, if I can, do a quick recap of what I heard from the three of you um, and then see where the common threads might be. So first of all, Krista gave us a really direct and clear um, overview of some of the issues that of environmental design that you, are you as young architects, you might need to be um, evolving, exploring and uh, trying to work with. Um, she also sent you the message that, you know, we need to, or you need to as architects need to be ambitious and really work from the beginning to integrate architecture and building performance. So um, that I think it would be really interesting to learn more about which aspects of that kind of analysis are kind of absent from ordinary everyday practice and how to bring those in. Um, Julia, we talked a lot about um, the role of incremental urbanism and the challenges and the opportunities of incremental urbanism. Um, also in the project that you showed us, Julia, I, I thought there was an interesting tension between sort of the, um, it was really interesting to hear you explore that tension between the power of incremental urbanism and the power of individual agency within the city, and then sort of the greater opportunities that come with collective action and the efficiencies in operation and finance that come with actually getting people together to uh, build infrastructure. Uh, and then with Thaddeus, you started with us um, with the question of linking uh, urbanism to the climate. Um, and you started with a very, I think a really important point um, that achieving the goals even of the Paris Agreement are gonna require dramatic changes to how we build cities, not just on the level of individual buildings, but on a broader level of urbanism and environmental design. Um, and so um, we also heard about the importance of public space and you made the connection very clear even in an American context between uh, environmental injustice and other forms of injustice and inequality. So um, I think it's interesting too, as maybe some of our attendees know, that if you were to do the same kind of analysis that Thaddeus brought to New York and applied it to Toronto, you would find the same sort of correlation between low income neighborhoods, communities of color, the heat island effect, um, and the incidence of COVID transmission. I mean, it's exactly the same map, more or less, um, in the Toronto context, just as those maps in the New York City context are quite similar. So um, I think, you know, there's some broad general points for us to work with here, uh, and ones that really apply directly to the context that a lot of Ryerson grads are going to be jumping into uh, in Toronto and in Canada. So um, maybe I can start with a general question. Um, how do, uh, let's talk, may, let's, maybe Christy, you can start us off with this. Um, as architects, where do you think the opportunities are for practitioners to address environmental design and how in practical terms might they get started in educating their clients and bringing the kinds of analysis that you do in your work into their work? You know, where are the gaps and where might they start in a practical sense to, to tackle this stuff? Um, that's a good question. I think um, the gap, some of the gap, I think, is in a lack of uh, understanding of, of what their their role is in the project and in, in kind of pushing that kind of vision forward. I think 
one of Julia or Sadia said something that kind of a uh, little light bulb in my head is like, architects know things can change. And, you know, sometimes clients don't know that things can change and, uh, or other kinds of people, like not everybody knows that things can just change. And that's architects like special magic that they have. Um, so I just think it's really important that they leverage it. Um, beyond, uh, you know, what, what else is missing is maybe just knowledge of what's going on out there in terms of case studies, what are people doing? Like not everybody needs to reinvent uh, the wheel. Um, but if you know that this building over here was able to have a fully daylit floor plan by, by kind of employing these strategies, and this building over here was able to get to net zero by doing X, Y, and Z, you're able to ask the question to your mechanical engineer or to and bring up to your client, hey, like these guys did this, is this something you're into? Um, like that's a, that's a pretty easy thing to do. And that really starts the whole uh, ball rolling. Right. And I mean, again, um, you use the phrase architecture without architects and, you know, that book, which the older architects in the room will know for sure, you know, was very fashionable at a certain point in history. And then that way of thinking, um, you know, of looking to local cues and vernacular cues for environmental design that all kind of went out the window. You know, there, it seemed like, you know, for me, looking in at the profession, it seemed like there was about a 30 year period where nobody was really thinking about even very basic questions like orientation, you know, and solar gain, you know, is that, um, is the profession doing better with that? Are architects doing better at, you know, bringing that basic awareness of environmental design, you know, back into their work? Anybody? I think yes and no, you know, certainly like, you know, vernacular architecture, there's just so much knowledge in how people used to do things because of the constraints of not free and cheap energy. Um, if you look at any of it, like if you just, there's so much, the best architects are doing it. And um, I think it, there is a lot happening on the other side. There's still like a big push of like developer driven buildings of what developers think will sell the best tenant space. And it just kind of is forcing. Uh, so I think there's like these two tracks and, and they're, they're, they're going ahead. And, and the thing that's kind of going to put the brakes on the developer track, I guess, um, is uh, this kind of policies that sort of force them to, to hold up, take a minute and, and say that you have to achieve a better, better standard of energy or a better standard of other things. Like another thing that, like I was saying that's missing is, you know, in North America, like there isn't this value in any of the energy codes or um, building codes about daylight or natural ventilation or things like that. Like the quality of life aspect is really only addressed by these kinds of well, like the well certificate or things like that, which are completely voluntary. Like, um, so I think that element of things is still is still yet to come to be integrated into building codes. Right. Um, and there is a fashion now, you know, the, uh, the office landlords are building bigger and bigger floor plates because that's what large tenants particularly mm -hmm. tech seem to want, right? Which is the opposite of, of what you've suggested is, you know, both, both desirable and is the norm in, in Western Europe. Yeah, it's it's kind of it's I, I'm not sure why they want it. This seems to be like this huge trend, especially with tech companies. They really want everybody on one floor. Right. Um, whereas I think there's you know other lots of other ways of of building having everybody be connected. Now we're you know in the coronavirus, we're all completely separated and we're still all working fine. So like this idea that we need to do it and have everybody on one floor, I think is is kind of strange to me. It's true. So. Um... Julia, you asked the basic question of you know, whether design has a role in addressing inequality. Um, and clearly your answer is yes. I think everybody would agree that the answer is yes. Um, but um, I have a real interest in incremental urbanism in the developed world, um, which is a thing we don't really do anymore. Um, and bringing it back to the Toronto context for the local audience, I co-edited a book about um, the missing middle, um, you know, helping to advocate for planning reform that would allow basically more incremental urbanism, more small scale development to happen in more places. Um, so, and that is a very difficult ask. Um, so I guess my question to you to start off with is, you know, given the focus of your work, you know, where and how can designers start to intervene in the developed world, in the global north, in policy, um, in politics, um, where and how should we be thinking beyond the scale of the individual project to try and make social change? 
I really like that sort of thinking of the missing middle. Um, and it is, you know, really great way of putting it. And I think it also, ah, very nice. I mean, there's a kind of cunningness that's, that's required for the sort of architect who wants to work in the missing middle. Um, and I guess, I mean, maybe, uh, I think there is a lot to learn. Um, and I, I think, um, I, I mean, Chris, so those were amazing buildings that you showed, mm -hmm. and 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 I and I don't want um, uh, and I hope um, I don't think that it's not worth those explorations and that kind of practice of architecture. I think is so valuable to push what is possible. But also, I mean, when I was an architecture student, I think climate buildings that were responsive to climate. You sort of imagined Birkenstock wearing kind of like. You, you know, it, 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 like sort of hippies designing it. And all of a sudden now it's like, actually, no, it's really sexy, awesome architecture. And I think that's, it, it needs to be aspirational. But I also think whilst we, we definitely need to push that and mainstream that, I, I think architects shouldn't be afraid to kind of ask a question before that. And, and, I, and, and it's about thinking of the sort of framework within which architecture is made which recognizes that kind of entanglement of climate change and politics and the politics of how cities are made. And that's where the inequality question comes in. Um, and so for example, in the UK, like our greenest building, um, it's a Norman Foster building, even you know, by their own standards, it's, it's, it's a kind of a three degree bu building. So even if all buildings hit this kind of award-winning foster level building, we're still in a climate emergency. Right. And so, you know, and that's kind of foster putting and it's Bloomberg money, you know, this is like a big building. And, and it's kind of, and it's part of a sort of a, an idea that's, and I think it's a mainstreamed idea that we can deal with our climate by, you know, optimizing community patterns, high performance materials, you know, greater span, less mass, reusable coffee cups. Um, you know, but actually it's the status quo that's the problem. And I tend to look at the status quo as a problem through an inequality lens. So I look at the kind of the way our buildings get made. I think it's incredibly unequal because the economic model that makes those buildings is a model where risks are socialized and gains are privatized. And you see that playing out in hospitals. Um, you see that playing out in how schools are made. So in, in the UK, uh, why we had a major COVID outbreak in Liverpool was because Carillion, a big company that gets all these contracts to build our built environment, went under and it went under and its shareholders are now in the Maldives on holiday. You know, it's completely unequal and it's not fair and it's not right. Um, oh my God, I've lost my train of thought. So, um, you know, I just think this, build, you know, business as usual is, it, it, it's the problem. And, and architects, I think, need to be a bit more comfortable challenging that and, and actually asking better questions that preclude the building. Um, sorry, I've, I've actually completely, anyway, yeah, <laughs> I hope that answered your question. No, that very much did actually, that was fantastic. And you touched on, you know, government procurement too, which is a whole other here as there is a, a gigantic mess that needs mm. to be addressed, but is an issue that's too complex and boring for even me as a journalist to write about a lot of the time. Um, so Thaddeus, let me kick it over to you. Um, what kinds of questions then, what kinds of better questions should architects and other design professionals be asking, you know, as they enter a project or as they engage with um, policy on a larger level? Yeah, well, um, you know, I, and I'm glad you brought up, Alex, like the way that design education has changed because, um, it's, you know, when I went to school, it was very much the same thing. Like if I showed up with Rudovsky, I would get like laughed out of the room. Everybody just like wanted to make, and I, I always had the problem where, you know, I would make a, a plan and then I would, you know, get much more interested in like what was happening around the building and then like what's happening on the street and then like what's happening down the street and to the point where I like never finished the plan, you know, like I just wanted to like expand the lens always. I think that's more accepted today. And you know, there was there was sort of a backlash, and 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 I think you know if now in, against like too much social purpose in architecture, especially like in the 1990s and 2000s, and um, it was sort of seen as cheapening. But actually, in retrospect, I think we can start to understand that there was also a backlash in society as a whole against greater liberalism and multiculturalism, and um, it was Reaganism. 
actually, that was like being lived out in white supremacy that was sort of being lived out in the architecture school that fought against like the social purpose of architecture. Architecture has always been like a social, you know, a very socially minded profession until Reaganism and white supremacy sort of invaded the profession, I think. And so I feel like what we're doing a lot of work today to do is like decolonize and, and, and try to strip out, we're, we're calling it at GSAP, like unlearning whiteness in the design profession. And I think we need to like really start to value like non-European, I mean, we should value European traditions, but like non-European traditions of architecture are, are starting to show, you know, their incredible value. And somebody wrote in the chat, like, like a lot of our interests that we know almost nothing about is like how indigenous architectures can actually be point to a lot of very good patterns for climate change adaptation. My friend Julia Watson just wrote a great book called no Tech. Tech. Yeah. yeah, yeah, she teaches with us at GSAP. And um, yeah, so I feel like we're just at the beginning of that whole conversation. And there's so much more work to be done. But back to this question of like what architects like should be doing to be part of these larger policy conversations about changing our, our work is, um, or changing our environments is, I feel that they're along with the Eurocentrism um, and you know white supremacy that's inherent in the design conversation. Um, there is a self-centeredness that I feel very guilty of in myself, or have tried to like recognize is that once we put a drawing on the table, we're like this is the thing that everybody should be looking at, you know, and it's like get on board with our project. Um, I think we need to be much better at joining. And so like uh, enjoying, like really joining social justice movements more than anything else um, that, you know, we don't have the solutions. In fact, I don't even use that word solutions at all anymore because I feel like we've got skills, you know, like we know how to draw things, visualize things, put things together in synthetic ways um, and actually build things. So we need to start deploying our skills part, as part of a larger mission of society and not think that we're coming up with all the great ideas. Yeah. Hmm. And then I guess you get um, quite quickly, when you deal with the most prosperous and fastest growing cities um, you know, in our current socioeconomic climate, which now includes Toronto. Toronto is now in that group of alpha cities that is seeing you know, continued job growth in tech and in finance and, you know, increased inequality coming with that. Um, but then you wind up with these very difficult questions where, you know, finding what the answers are to, you know, a more just city um, and a more resilient city and a more sustainable city are, off, are politically contested, right? And not everybody agrees on what the right approach is. So, I mean, this is not going to be an easy question to answer, um, but I mean, rather than just getting involved and thinking in a um, thinking in some of the ways that you've described and being um, more receptive to different sets of ideas, you know, what what do you guys think the causes are? I mean, what actually should architects be fighting for? I mean, some of them at the building level are quite obvious, but you know, what what would your if you are defining a politics or you know requesting that people take up politics, what would it what would it be for? Well, I, you know, so can I just start because there's something I should have talked about in my talk and I meant to, which is that we're very focused on the Green New Deal in US policy. Um, and it's, you know, it's a very simple piece of legislation that wasn't very elaborated, but sort of set out a, a set of principles about deep decarbonization and the energy transition, just transition to post fossil fuel. And um, we're engaged in this process with about a hundred design schools around the world to look at what the Green New Deal would look like on the ground. We're calling it the Green New Deal Super Studio. Uh, we're organizing it with the Landscape Architecture Foundation and the McCarg Center at Penn. And so I'm doing one in Pittsburgh. Colleagues of mine are doing them around New York City and the Hudson Valley, but they're in all over North America and there's a few other international cities. So this Green New Deal, like what it looks like on the ground, isn't just about like, you know, sponge parks and, you know, um, 
solar farms and offshore wind and you know energy efficient buildings. It is all that stuff. But I think, especially like using it, at, I don't know how familiar Canadians are with the New Deal, but there was like this New Deal that was like this very, like the last time that there was a lot of city building in the public sector in the United States. Um, which was like urban renewal, interstate highways, all these things sort of came out of this moment where we constructed modern American consumerism through public investment. And uh, this new Green New Deal could be a way for us to reverse a lot of those processes, I think, um, starting with like reparations, first of all, um, and rethinking like the redistribution of wealth through you know, fair housing, um, through uh, a different approach to building infrastructure. Um, but it also has to do with like how we work on the ground on these projects. Like, so if you're gonna build a solar farm somewhere, like what is your first conversation with the people who are, you know, coming with the technology or is it with the people that have cared for the land on um, which is being built, you know, changing the pipeline of how we deliver projects to be much more centered on, uh, the historically disempowered. Thank you for that. And I'd love to hear from the both of you. I just want to drop in one quick um, point. You mentioned sort of in passing that is indigenous thinking about architecture. That's a, you know, that's a real theme in Canadian architecture right now. A lot of people are interested in pursuing that. And, you know, one very clear and perhaps slightly surprising manifestation of that is what's happening in Vancouver, where the Squamish nation has back a piece of their traditional lands that are now on the edge of downtown Vancouver, which they're now developing in this very tiny little strip, 12 high rise buildings containing something like 6,000 rental apartments, um, which will have almost no car parking, be entirely rental, be built as sustainably as high rise buildings can build, be built these days and be surrounded by public green space. Um, so that is, you know, building 70 story towers might not be, uh, you know, the obvious version of sustainable design in many people's eyes, but, you know, for this group, you are delivering people the ability, you know, 10,000 10, people, the ability to live more or less car free um, in as sustainable with as small a footprint effectively as is possible right now. So um, yeah, it's uh, these things can take some surprising directions, but I interrupted Julia, you had something to say. Oh yeah, just, I mean, thank you. I, yes, that sounds fascinating. Um, the, I, I've been from across the pond looking at the Green New Deal and I'm sort of fascinated by it because I think it's sort of, there's so many fascinating things about looking at climate justice through housing. And then, I mean, really simple things of going, look, we've got this huge housing stock of public housing that's completely dilapidated. And also if you map over unemployment over that, that's going to correlate. So you can then invest money to make those homes better and make them greener. I mean, it's such a no brainer. And, and you know, it's obvious, uh, which is another challenge as to why the stuff that's so obvious isn't getting done. Um, and it is, I think we are beginning, it's beginning to get more normalized, this idea of really celebrating repair, maintenance and care. And I think COVID has really accelerated, particularly that kind of thing of care. You know, what does a city that cares for its citizens look like? Um, and, and I think from my kind of three sort of, I mean, maybe, maybe the fulcrum of it, how I, how I like to think really on a really basic level is, and I, this is how I frame my, whenever I teach, is that if, if you want to design, you first need to know what is there, what is, and then you can propose what could be. Because nine out of 10, a bad building or a bad piece of urbanism, it's bad because it hasn't paid attention to what's already there. And sometimes so it's like on a really basic level, it will be parachuting in things that already existed in forms that people might not have realized, or, you know, or it's um, completely devoid of the residents who already live there. And from that, you get a sort of a range of trip, uh, you know, triple effects. So kind of just a simple starting point. That's always how I like to sort of frame it for sort of young aspiring architects. And I think if you have that lens, it's, it's really, um, really useful. And in terms of like, why I think the repair, maintenance and care, and, and you know, in the UK, I don't think we're, as good as talking about race um, as we should be. Um, but um, we, we are really good. There's been a lot of great recent debate around gender and you know that kind of compassionate city that I'm talking about is also a feminist city. Um, and, and, and why a feminist city is I, th I think, I hope that a city that is good for women 
is good for black people it's good for kids it's good for immigrants and so that as a lens i think is is a useful lens and so for example transport in most cities is about getting white men to work in sort of jobs in the city center so what about a transport system that's about carers that's about um you know and in the in the context of delhi women who work as domestic workers and so on so in housing in the uk we've got some of the smallest housing sizes in europe we need to seriously listen to krista's light air ventilation you know these are really basic things and then yeah public space for me is the sort of it's the in the uk context it's increasingly privatized and increasingly being uh, sort of assets that are being sold off and we desperately need genuinely accessible spaces. And um, these are all things that sort of COVID has brought out. Um, Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> we touched on- Abrupt end. <laughs> no, um, the number of threads to pick up there, but I'll let Krista answer the question first. Krista, you know, what sort of agenda would you put forward? Yeah, I mean, aside from the things that I already brought up, um, quality of life, uh, things in buildings, and uh, low emissions, obviously climate change is the biggest threat facing everybody in the planet. Um, we really uh, obviously need to take it seriously. The other thing that I would bring up uh, is, is parking. I think that's like, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm on the ground. So I think really practically about what, what I would want people to do. And a lot of projects, you know, we've managed to get out of multiple floors of underground parking and save all that money and be able to put it into green design because, right. you know, 10 years from now, are people really going to need to park the car under a building? Probably not. And um, and the other thing is, I mean, even more than that is, you know, think about not building buildings that people need to drive to. Like, it's just, I mean, if you have control over that, if you have some element of control over, uh, or if, or create mixed use buildings that people have places to go within their own space, they have to be way out there because like nobody wants to be in these buildings where they have to drive to work and then they have to drive to go to McDonald's or go somewhere for lunch and then they have to drive back. Like people want to be in spaces where they can go outside and have a nice time. And, you know, one thing with the pandemic in the summer, it was just um, right now, I mean, normally in New York, but right now I'm in Ottawa and it was just fantastic to see everyone was outside all the time. The streets were just vibrant. Like, let's not lose that. Let's keep uh, working with, you know, designed to, to, to support that even more and create like these kinds of mid door spaces that can keep our space outdoor environment comfortable a little further on so that people are spending more and more time outside and that will reduce our energy use and make us all happier and healthier. Thank you. And thank you for steering it back around to COVID and for our, to what we might have learned from the pandemic. Um, you know, I think there is a danger of, you know, allowing, um, you know, major of, you know, having uh, major events reinforce one's own prior views. But, um, you know, I think a number, all three of you have, you know, echoed things that strike me as very clear and very important um, that are existing cities in which in can, and in many cases should grow much denser than they already are. Um, a rich and well-designed public amenities, um, especially outdoor space needs to be there. Um, and that that intensification or that um, concentration of the city allows for all sorts of opportunities. When you have more density, it allows for um, a mix of uses to thrive. It allows for people to get around day to day without having to drive or having to drive long distances. So there's an overlap between, to some degree, um, equity, um, um, sustainability, um, specifically climate resilience, um, and quality of life. So, you know, I mean, it almost seems as though um, that more, um, a more just city has all of these spatial qualities uh, that we have come to appreciate or come to look for more over the past year. Um, let me just put it, put it to you then, am I off base or is that, um, and, and that of course overlaps to some degree with you know, some of what is wrapped up in the Green New Deal. Um, or what certain people are wrapping up with the Green New Deal. So is there then, um, am I full of it? Or is there sort of a new agenda for urbanism or a renewed agenda for urbanism that um, coheres in that way? I mean, I'll have a quick, quick. we'll see if I can have a quick stab. I mean, I, I, I think the jury is still not out. Um, I think it's really, I mean, I'm currently in a hard lockdown um, I think it's really hard to say, you know, people are predicting, oh, it's the end of cities and so on. 
I really hope it's not the end of cities and I also don't think it is. Um, you know, I think density and crowds, it's kind of, and sort of scales of economy, it's, it's a kind of, it's, it's, it's us, it's our society, it's, it's, it's what we are. And actually it's brilliant because cities can be these sort of, uh, you know, mobility and it widens possibilities and it's allowed, um, you know, uh, discriminated groups to forge new identities and like, you know, I'm gay and I went to London because I could imagine no other place where I could be out and proud and and find a you know a wife. I mean, these are these are really important things, and I don't think that's going to be taken over because all of a sudden now I work from home. You know, that's ridiculous. So, um, you know, I really hope it's not the end of cities. And I think this kind of Dickensian specter of overcrowding and contagion and disorder, which we've sort of linked to social density, really it's, it needs to be nipped in the bud because it's not density that's the problem with COVID. It's overcrowding, you know, that's the problem. And that is a result of inequality, again, to bring that up. Um, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, that's a sort of social condition where we're fine cramming in bodies into tiny, tiny apartments. Can you, you know, sorry so, to interrupt, but this is, you know, I think incredibly important. Can you spin that out for the audience and just explain the distinction? So um, density, for example, you can have really high dense cities um, with perfectly suitable accommodation, like with two bedrooms and, you know, a horizontal uh, airflow is coming through them. I mean, many European cities, I mean, London is actually, you know, really dense at quite a low, low pack. So density, you can have really high density and that doesn't necessarily equate to, um, uh, so, sorry, so, so density you can have, and that can be very well designed, good, high density. And some of our greater cities have really high densities. Now, overcrowding is where you have too many people in too many bedrooms. So if you go onto the census data and look at London, and if you correlate uh, one bedrooms, so bedrooms that where you have multiple people sharing a single bedroom, that's what will correlate with over uh, with the COVID cases. Right. And that is a social construct and that is an inequality construct and has nothing to do with density. 100%, yeah, thank you for that. And I mean, for what it's worth in the local Toronto context, I wrote about exactly this a few months ago and what you've just described plays out here in precisely the same way. It's exactly the same thing. Um, Krista, that is? Oh, well, the same is true in New York, for sure. I mean, we saw we saw the difference in density and, and overcrowding. Um, we have a lot of neighborhoods in New York where, um, you know, it also overlaps with, with service workers, frontline workers, um, lower incomes, public assistance. There's, there's this like, um, we're, we're working with the New York City government with the Mayor's Office of Resiliency on this climate adaptation roadmap right now. And you know, a lot of these roadmaps, like policy, it's like a policy document that's going to like try to assemble all these different things that they're working on and try to like tell a story about how they're synthetic and, um, and, and tell a story about how different New York City neighborhoods are going to adapt to climate change um, through like hardening of infrastructure or like investments to like move people away from the waterfront and so forth. And, and so in order to do this, we are like, what makes a place vulnerable? Um, and so what was, you know, a different approach for us, rather than just looking at like sort of the data, which is instructive, um, we realized that we had to look a little bit more at the history. Um, and so, like I showed earlier, a redlining map, but even going back, you know, further than that to understand these sort of regimes of change that have happened in different neighborhoods over time. And, and we start to realize that vulnerability is not just a consequence. It's, it's like actively constructed in our built environment. Um, and we planners and urban designers have been complicit in that construction of vulnerability through interstate highways drilling through the center of neighborhoods, through urban renewal programs that created the conditions for overcrowding. Um, uh, Social and, housing and uh, floodplains. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So um, yeah, but I mean, to your like initial question, yeah, I, I think like these words like better quality of life or more sustainable or, you know, um, 
uh, like just good urbanism, happy urbanism, resilient urbanism, smart urbanism. I feel like it's all like we're always just like switching around the uh, the adjective, but really like we're we're in this process of learning about how we take control over the spaces we build and not just leave it to being you know complicit with the forces of of. I don't even know how they call it. I don't want to be too Marxist and just call it like rapacious capitalism, but I mean, oftentimes that's the case. Thank you. Um, it's a tricky but Also, it's banality. It's like just bad architecture too. Yeah. They're, they're, they're linked. <laughs> All true. All the, I mean, I don't think this is necessarily a road we should go down. Um, I'm going to uh, just look at the Q&As. We're going to open it up to audience questions now, and we already have uh, two questions in the box. So audience members, if you want to put in a question, um, please enter it into the Q&A box and we will get to them. Um, I guess before I get to that question, though, um, there seems like one this is an issue that has been a bit of a hobby horse for me. So we don't necessarily have to go down this road too far. But you know, you mentioned the relationship between capitalism uh, and architecture. Uh, you know, in the North American urban left, there is a close. You know, there's a fundamental assumption. You know, that's 50 years old now that development is bad, right? And so, you know, progressives often are lining up with people who are decidedly not progressive in fighting development because the idea is that changing the city, building new housing, if it's the market doing it is inherently bad. Um, and that strikes me as, you know, um, simplistic and, you know, in some cases counterproductive. Um, you can't rebuild an entire city without the market. Um, but that is, you know, this is an absolute hot potato um, in any sort of discussion about urban change. Um, so before I get to this question, I'm just reading here, does anybody have any thoughts on that? I mean, how should, um, architecture and architecture with a progressive lens, um, think about that question, you know, what, where does development fit in and what should development do or not do? You know, I spent like 10 years in the New York City Department of City Planning where we basically just like negotiated with developers. Like they, they come in with like the biggest, ugliest, most overbuilt thing. And then we'd be like, okay, but no, a park over here or whatever, like shape the building there. So, I mean, I do think that there's ways to like, I mean, it's just regulations, like which we, we've been, you know, so bad at, like I'm not anti-development and might sound like it sometimes, but like what the concentration of wealth and power and money in politics, um, the real estate board of New York, for instance, like sort of deciding who's going to be the next mayor and on down like that, that, that's the problem, you know, it's not so much that an individual developer is bad, but like we, we allow so much wealth and power to be concentrated by, by deregulation. It's about the right kind of regulation, productive regulation that gets better results, not stopping everything necessarily, but shaping it in ways yeah. that are beneficial. Yeah, and crafting legislation is a very hard thing. Like, you know, there was a city planning commissioner in New York that said, like, why is it when they do exactly what we tell them to do, we never get what we want? Like, there's like a real art to, like, you know, crafting appropriate legislation. But, you know, Krista, maybe you could talk about like the building codes in New York and, you know, that has been getting progressively more stringent. Um, and maybe, you know, there have been some positive impacts of that but like often what what's helped with that maybe she knows more but like to do it well you've got to listen to the people who are actually doing the work like listen to the architects and engineers to craft the legislation right yeah i mean i think uh on building codes and things like that we're at the point now where certainly not every municipality but a lot of the, the big ones are kind of listening to people who really know what they're talking about and they're getting get, getting there the message hasn't necessarily gotten to the building community as a whole uh for them to understand what what it's going to take um but i think i think we will get there um i think also on the topic of you know like architecture and you know architects get paid by people who pay them to build buildings. So, you know, money is always a big influence in the whole, whole thing. And, and it's not going to change, you know, but some, one thing that we are doing and I'm not suggesting that this is a big solution to anything, but, you know, like we have an academy where we bring architecture students, architects and engineers from several countries, and they, they work in our firm for a year 
and they have all this training to learn how to do climate engineering. And I know Mass Design also has one of those um, in their Rwanda office. Um, so, you know, people doing what they can to like spread the knowledge that they have, um, you know, it's probably not a solution, but it's a start to, to start um, making these kinds of things. Like it's like, de is design accessible to people who are building, you know, with limited means? Um, not really right now, but it doesn't have to be. It's just, it's just information, you know, it's just knowledge. So the more we can spread that, I think that we can really have a lot of um, impact. Fair enough. And you met, I mean, you showed a whole range of projects and your work from, you know, very um, high end projects in some cases to um, less expensive ones and ones for, you know, public clients, even ones in North America. I mean, one thing uh, students might or might not be aware of the um, Manitoba Hydro building that you pulled up that you worked on with uh, KPMB of Toronto. And that's a building that has, you know, accomplishes a whole lot. Um, you know, within a fairly conventional context and, you know, achieve some things mm -hmm. in terms of ventilation that seem incredibly, you know, valuable and prescient right now, right? So uh, I guess government, mm -hmm. can, government can help, government can lead the way. Sorry. No, no. Um, You're going to have to repeat that, the baby was like. Oh, I, I feel you. Uh, I was just asking, you know, can the public sector, you know, obviously that is, you know, a broad aim of a lot of the Green New Deal movement, but in the US, but, you know, can government get us to a better place? Can government lead the way to better forms of practice? Absolutely. And, you know, government projects um, and institutional projects, like the universities and the government projects are the ones that are kind of mandating that like we have to achieve this because we set out, you know, our public is demanding that we do something about climate change. We do something about all of these issues. So we are going to um, be the leaders, um, of course, you know, and then they're also, which is kind of great, you know, they're, they're budgetarily constrained. They can't be shown, they can't be buying, building a super expensive building. So it forces the design team to not only achieve the targets, but do it for an unreasonable way. So I think I think they are, and and they should, maybe they need to also do a better job of of showing what they've done. You know, they go and they do it, and they spend all this money, and then it kind of just gets used by the office workers or whoever. So um, I guess this, this again back to this idea of like the sharing of knowledge is super important. I think uh, if you're gonna gonna do it. Thank you. Um, a question from an anonymous attendee. Um, thank you all for the fantastic presentations. Um, and his, this person's question is, for students who aspire to career paths that might not fit into traditional paradigms of architecture and project delivery, can you recommend ways to connect with more progressive companies or organizations, you know, especially right now, in order to learn about what the day-to-day -day work looks like or to explore future roles and opportunities? Yeah, I, you know, I was just, I was thinking, well, well, uh, Krista was just talking to that government is a great place. For, I mean, or like government can help if, if more designers get into government, like we really need like designers to go into the public sector. And I would say like, that was extremely unpopular. Like my, my friends from graduate school, like just kind of laughed at me when I went to work for the government. They were like, what are you doing that for? That could not possibly be interesting. But it turned out to be really interesting. So that's the other thing is like, just from my own experience, I feel like, you know, don't be afraid to go an uncommon path. And I feel like there's going to be a lot of, um, both in Canada and the United States, a lot more public sector jobs opening as we try to dig ourselves out of this mess that we've been in. Um, you know, we're going to have this $1.9 trillion stimulus package and a lot of that money will flow to state and city governments, um, but probably more infrastructure spending. So working in the public sector, I feel like is a very good uh, career trajectory. I, my first job in government was working at the New York City Office of Emergency Management, which that's a whole other interesting field for young designers to really understand how things fall apart. Um, and it's a great way to like see how they can be put together better. So I would encourage that direction. And I'd like to echo that too. I mean, definitely working into the public sector and empower public sector has got to mean, um, you know, better 
better public spaces. Um, but I also think um, community groups, I mean, if you, you know, definitely if you want to do more on the work on the ground, you know, if you're more policy orientated, maybe sort of government, but, but um, the same is true. You can, you can, you can work in government, actually find yourself really on the ground. Um, depends the kind of job, but I, I found it, you know, I, I, I basically got in bed with a, with a, an NGO that was had really great um, networks in communities so that I could piggyback their very expansive set of, you know, community liaison officers and so on. And, and that just allowed me to have time to spend in places that would otherwise be completely foreign to me. And I think you can do that working, you know, for organizations in, you know, in the UK context, like shelter, if you're interested in housing or, you know, in, in health organizations and, um, and, and I, I think just be cunning, be creative, and actually you'll really um, pay off in your career down the line. I'm on mute. I was. Uh, quest, thank you very much, um, Julia. A uh, question now from Matthew Delorier. Um, again, thanks to everyone. Uh, Matthew says, I'm not a student of architecture, but definitely interested. So apologies if this question is a bit obvious. Um, it's a good question, though. Um, it would seem to me, he says, that clients drive a lot of what gets built through their briefs and RFPs and other processes. Are there ways the profession can shape those briefs or help clients to rethink what they build or imagine a different future than what they might have in mind? I think this is an ex-student asking of mine asking this question. <laughs> I'm not going to answer. <laughs> Uh, he says not. Um, I can okay. I can just I can touch on it. Uh, I guess uh, I I find a lot of the architects we work with challenge the brief. You know, it's it's a risk, especially in a competition, to to, to challenge the brief. But like I've seen people win on it. It's totally possible. Um, so don't be totally afraid if there's a brief that just doesn't make sense and they're doing something totally illogical. Propose something. I have, a, I have a great example. So there's a fantastic practice here in the UK called Architecture Zero Zero. You might have heard, um, you know, they've designed WikiHouse, which I think is a sort of global brand. And they were hired to, for a school. And the school says we need to build an extension. And as part of the research that they did when they were looking at this school, they looked at the timetable. And then they said they went back to the client and they went, actually, we've had a look at your timetable and we're going to redesign your timetable so you can use your spaces better. And then think about actually of using that budget for an extension in an even better way. So I think that's, you know, there's already examples like that. Uh, really, I mean, I'm sure there's more, but I love that one of redesigning a timetable rather than the building. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I think we're supposed to have a hard stop at two. So I guess it is probably time for us to wind up. Uh, I'm just going to take one back look through the questions here. Um, yeah, there's nothing I think we can get through in the next um, two minutes or so. So perhaps I'll just wind up here. Thank you all. It's been a great conversation and I really uh, enjoyed hearing from each of you. So thank you very much. Um, and I'll pass it back to Adam. Uh, yes, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, speakers. Those were some great presentations as well, discussion. And thank you very much, Alex, for your uh, very well run uh, discussion section. It was uh, quite effective. And I think this was a very, uh, this turned out to be quite well as an event. Uh, we also want to thank our uh, faculty, DAS, Department of Architectural Science, as well as the IT team and our Masters of Architecture Program Director, Marco Polo, for this opportunity. Uh, we also want to thank the OAA and I, uh, AIA as media partners. And thank you very much for everybody coming out on a Saturday, as well as phoning in from different time zones. This was um, a great experience. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank Alex, you. for sharing that. Hi, that was everyone. great. So nice to meet you. Absolutely my pleasure. Thanks for the time.